Hi, this is it. August 2nd, Sue Hall and Tristan MacDonald here, excited to introduce the Whole Dyslexic Society's first series of podcasts as we talk the dis out of dyslexia. We had so much fun meeting Greg Moore, ex-mayor of Port Coquitlam, now president and CEO of BC Lottery Corporation, and this could not be a better podcast to kick us off, as I think we seem to have covered pretty much every aspect of dyslexia in a short space of time. So, uh, Greg Moore, I was in a room next to your presentation room at the Dakota conference, and I heard thunderous applause and lots of laughter. <laughs> and when some people came into my presentation, I asked them what was going on next door, and they said, "Well, it was Greg Moore, and he was giving this um, uh, presentation." And at the very end, he decided to tell everybody that he was dyslexic. <laughs> and uh, apparently, you hadn't mentioned that to anybody before. Um, yeah, there was lots of uh, laughter and applause which was great there was a lot of tears as well um, wow. uh, yeah it was the first time I had ever uh, publicly given a talk on uh, dyslexia and maybe the challenges not maybe the challenges that I've gone through in life yeah. with dyslexia and, and just sort of keeping it to myself and so yeah. uh, or my family so this was the first time so yeah it was it was a pretty emotional day I can might imagine. be emotional right now because I don't talk about it that much wow, wow. But that's interesting. So, my my um, view of dyslexia is off, obviously a, maybe a little different from yours because um, I got into this through my son. Um, his learning didn't th th what they were doing for him in school didn't make sense. I found something that was different. I became a facilitator in this method, mm -hmm. and then I discovered that I had this way of thinking. And so, when I see people who are dyslexic, I say, "Yay, <laughs> you've got this gift, right?" And I oft I see it as a compliment. Yeah. Um, but obviously, I get into trouble because not everybody <laughs> you're sees a little it. biased. <laughs> <laughs> Not everybody sees it that way, yeah. particularly when you haven't done anything to to stop it being a challenge. Yeah, you know, I think um, you know my journey in life. Um, you do, I think, is I think in in any sort of challenge, and with dyslexia being no different, is is you find your own coping mechanisms, yeah. and whether it's coping in. Um, how people will make comments about your writing style or no style or your spelling or whatever. Um, for me, I found humor in just sort of laughing it off or joking about it and that sort of thing. But then I also found tactics in my political and business life of how not to put myself in those situations. Um, and, and I think that's what's allowed me to succeed is figuring out all aspects of, of how to deal with yeah. situations around dyslexia not and, and and you know not telling anyone I would never want to ever even now use it as a crutch to do something or get something because well mm -hmm. you know he's got dyslexia so we'll just uh, you know I no know. I want to you know on my own merit sort of thing that implies that he's a bit faulty right I mean mm -hmm. that's the, the, the stigma the, yeah the, yeah that's the well it's a stigma with dyslexia or any sort of yeah. learning challenge or mental health issue or that sort of thing there's yeah. so much stigma that society yeah. puts on so many yeah. aspects of it and they would invent a word that began with dis which really doesn't help at all well and <laughs> I joke my, the name of my talk which they didn't use is like, what should we name your talk oh. at the Dakota conference? And I'm like, why is dyslexia so hard to spell? <laughs> that was a good I title. Couldn't, you could ask me right now. I couldn't spell it. Well, that's a, good title. No that's a good title. Well, the title of my book is Fish Don't Climb that's Trees right. because of that quote um, from Meinstein that everyone is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will grow up its whole life believing it's stupid. Yeah. Um, so that's where yeah, yeah. that title came from. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah it's so cool. Can relate. Totally. <laughs> so um, what did you think dyslexia was? Um, you know, when I was in elementary school, um, I don't think they put a title on it. It was just a learning disability, right? right? So I went to, in elementary school, I had the, I was lucky enough that they had a, uh, I, 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 was, I was just a special English class that I would go to. I don't remember much about it. Um, and I was lucky my dad was a high school counselor in, in our community. Mm -hmm. um, they really did. I don't know. I really don't know if they knew it was dyslexia or they just thought it was a learning disability. You know, mm -hmm. can't spell and do sentence structure and all this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so they would send me to because my dad could pull some strings. 
to additional English classes. <laughs> and I have phenomenal English teachers, Mrs. Cook and Mrs. Curtis, and they were so patient and wonderful, but they didn't really, I don't, I don't really believe that they knew um, that I had, if they knew what dyslexia was, they didn't know if I had it and all that sort of stuff. So they were just trying to be gentle with me and trying to teach me, um, which, you know, in retrospect is, is you know, I don't know if that was a good thing, being put through torture twice in a day instead of just one English class. <laughs> well, I mean, that, that often happens. I mean, that happens now when you can't do something. They give yeah. you more of what you couldn't yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. And, and yes, obviously, it's often very well presented and everybody's very kind and encouraging and so on. But basically, they're still giving you more of what you couldn't do. And then when you can't do it in class and you can't do it in the, the special mm -hmm. class, then you mm -hmm. try at home and you try with tutors. And that's why I get the kids who are by grade four particularly completely convinced that they're stupid yeah for um. sure and I know um, like I would I would I remember I would go home and I would practice reading out loud and I would just be in my bedroom and I, I don't know what I'd probably be reading Sports Illustrated but I would just <laughs> read it out loud just mm -hmm. to practice because um, I didn't really know what I had I just knew that that yes. repetition and just continually doing it would be helpful yeah. I guess in life mm -hmm. um, so yeah because the worst well, days in English class or any class was having to read out loud in front of yeah. everyone like it was just even to this day I like even to this day where you know my political life and now my professional life I've given a lot of speeches mm -hmm. and um, I've had to learn how to give speeches in my own way and uh, some people are very talented and can read a speech and you wouldn't even know they're reading a speech for me we write the speech and then we just put some key words and then I pretty much just have to memorize the speech and then I give it which has worked out really well because people will compliment me on my speaking style and they'll say you're so genuine you just are <laughs> speaking from the heart and I'm like well I am to a certain extent but the truth be told is I couldn't read you a speech even if I wanted to so I have to speak from my knowledge and what I know and people can relate to people if they speak from their heart yeah yeah, yeah. Right. so it's served me extremely well in totally, my public totally, speaking life totally. and the repetition that you mention is something that the education system loves because um, if you if you have this education system right that um, deals basically um, I like to think of it as they reach the little PC computers because they're sound based and yet we happen to be the little Apple Mac computers because we're non-verbally based, we're, we're images and feelings and so in the, re in the world of, of sound repetition absolutely works, right? Mm -hmm. If you keep saying GIFT, 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 eventually you'll learn how to spell GIFT, right? Mm -hmm. But for us it doesn't work because if you're a visual thinker and I say to you, um, picture where you live now, picture where you live now, picture where you live now, you'll think, why does she keep asking me? <laughs> I got the picture the first time, right? Yeah, yeah. So if you, if it's a, t it's a totally different way of thinking and learning. And yeah, and it's interesting because my first career uh, was a city planner, right? Which is great because, to your point about visualizing things, I can visualize a whole city in my head. I can see it. How can you tell me you're going to put a whatever story building over there? I can see it and I can look all around it and all that sort of stuff. My challenge is in city planning is that then I have to write a report about that I building know. and that's where it all falls apart exactly exactly <laughs> I, that is a struggle for so many people that nowadays particularly um I, well backing up a little bit in my day so to speak you could learn to do things hands-on you could be a mechanic mm -hmm. hands-on you could be a chef hands-on you could be a carpenter hands-on but these days i'm getting adults coming for for programs because they have to do a red seal which involves a huge amount of studying mm -hmm. and writing and yeah. and firemen too yeah. and i think that's probably what what blocks a lot of young adults from pursuing a career uh, in many different areas um, because in the beginning you are you're the you're the report writer you're the got to write the test you got to do all of these things and if you choose an office job there's a lot of writing in the beginning of a career for the first Absolutely. whatever 10 or 15 years of pretty much any yeah. career yeah. Um, and then you get to a point where you hardly do any writing Yes. Right? yes. Like I'm at a point in my career uh, here at, you know, being the CEO at BCLC is I write some emails, but I don't do a lot of, you, you would never catch me writing a report, no. right? But no. that's, I have teams to exactly. do that now and that sort yeah. of thing. So. Yeah. But you get uh, uh, somebody like Richard Branson, for example. I don't. I think I heard that he has a difficult time with the alphabet. He mm -hmm. he never got the concept of net profit. I mean, this is hilarious. Mm -hmm. He's a yeah. billionaire, right? Yeah. And he had to have a picture given to him quite late on in his career, yeah. um, where net profit was the fish that you take home in the net, yeah. and the gross profit is the fish that gets away, right? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, that that blows me away that yeah. he could get to that level. 
Um, but you you get very clever at finding right. people who can do things. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You figure your way around it, yeah, right? Like, you, totally. I think when I tell people that I have dyslexia uh, and and the different you know the jobs that I've had, people are just blown away. Like you, know, when I went to the Dakota conference, um, my friend Heather Deal, who is a city councilor in Vancouver, who works for Dakota, um, I was just catching up with her because we left politics at the same time. Oh, what are you up to? I work for Dakota now. What's that? Mm -hmm. She tells me, and I'm like, and I, for some reason, I felt that because I know Heather really well, and we've done a lot of great stuff together, uh, I felt comfortable saying, "Hey, by the way, I have dyslexia." Mm -hmm. She's like, "Get out of here! <laughs> There's no way." I've known you for 10 years, like really well. We worked at Metro Vancouver really closely on lots of big files. She's like, I don't believe you. And I'm like, yeah, it's true. That's hilarious. And we had a conversation about it. Yeah. yeah. So her definition of dyslexia is obviously the old school um, definition, right? That there's something wrong yeah. with our brains. And this is the, apparently in the very beginning, um, the early brain scan showed that good readers are processed in the left brain right whereas poor readers processed in the right brain right and um therefore the education system put uh, this this method of reading together that focused on us having to learn to read by processing auditorily so the big challenge for us is sounding out we don't do phonics it's not in our wheelhouse right it's painful and the more we don't do it the more we're given it and then we still can't do it but that's because we can't do it and there's nothing wrong with our brains we can process perfectly well in the visual cortex right yeah. um, um, but nowadays, the brain scans are showing that actually there are good and poor readers, whether they process in, in the visual cortex or the auditory mm -hmm. cortex, but the education system hasn't caught up with that yeah, yet, yeah. Um, which is so sad. Yeah, yeah, I get, yeah, yeah, I just think about the millions of people they have to educate and have to find a common ground somewhere in there somewhere. But yeah, it's true. The phonics thing is really funny because <laughs> my staff uh, in my previous job in, as mayor, would uh, you know? I'd have to give speeches, and there'd be names in there and all that sort of stuff. And then they would uh, they'd write them out in phonics, and I'd be just going, "I'm like, it's even worse." <laughs> like, for, for a while there, they were like, they were trying to be so helpful because uh, it was my close staff. I told them that I had dyslexia. Um, so they'd write the name, then they would take out the old name and just leave the phonics name in there. So I don't even have a reference to guess no. what it was. And, I, and so we had to go through, I'm like, okay, that's even worse. And I said, phonics doesn't work. It's like, just sound it out, but yeah. don't do, you, you put more vowels in, like, <laughs> you might as well. And, but, but, you know, so everyone, so, and, it, and it honestly became a little bit of a humorous joke to a certain extent sad on one hand because it was made into a joke but um because i didn't disclose it uh, yeah. uh in the community and you know when you're in a part of a community you give lots of speeches and all these sort of things and there's a group of people that go to certain ones all the time and mm. uh, you know i'd get some people's names wrong yeah. i was mayor for 10 years yeah. all 10 years i'd just get their name wrong yeah. and i'd say rob and i'm like and i'd say it i'm like i'm gonna get your name wrong yeah. and i'd try it like stumbling through it like a some a kid in grade one learning English and then we would just all laugh with yeah, it. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And the funny thing is when we're asked to, to learn to read with phonics, um, guess what? We start spelling with phonics, right? <laughs> so the sp that's called really atrocious spelling, right? Because our language isn't built for that. And I discovered recently that we would need 650 rules to spell 90% of the tw most common 20,000 words that we use. 650 rules is ridiculous. Nobody's ever going <laughs> to learn them, right? And so why do they even do it? Because, like, as an adult, right, it, again, if I were sitting next to you and I didn't know a word, I'd say to you, what's G-I-F-T? And you'd say gift, right? I would never say, what's G-I-F-T? <laughs> yeah, as an adult yeah. so why don't we do the spell reading from yeah. the beginning well and it's interesting because um, we in my career I'm old enough now that uh, when I started my career there was triplicate memos right and I thought oh my gosh I'm going to be in so much trouble because <laughs> I, I now I'm a, I'm a planner I'm working inside a city hall and I'm like Oh, this is going to be awful. like how am I going to get through this and at the time being sold you dictated your reports Right, we had a dictating machine. Yes. So I'm like, 
Oh, that's a bonus. Yeah, yeah. I just have to speak into this thing and someone else types it. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. But now I got to write these triplicate things. Oh, this is not going to be good. Um, but I, I, it was right as sort of word processing came in. So that would have been, you know, the mid 90s to late 90s, right as it came over. And then spell check came in. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, this is brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, and it really, even, but it, honestly, to this day, uh, I spell so poorly that spell check doesn't even know the word I'm spelling. Yeah. So I actually have to write it into Google, which has a way better spell checker than like Microsoft Word or anything else. Google will always, always, majority of the time, get the word that I'm really atrociously spelling uh, correct. And then I take it and copy and paste it and put it back into the email that I'm writing. That's so interesting. Yeah. That's so cool. So um, if if I said to you um, that uh, the gift of dyslexia, I don't know if you've had a chance to, to have a peep at my book, but the gift of dyslexia for me, right, is this ability to have a, a, an image in your head that is three-dimensional, right? So, for example, if I said to you, could you close your eyes and see an elephant, right? When I'm doing this in talks, you will have some people who don't see a thing. It's just black. You'll have some people who see a flat two-dimensional photograph, and then you'll have people who can see the three-dimensional elephant, right? And I'm guessing that might be you. Yeah. Um, and then all I'm asking them is, the place that's doing the looking, can you move it around the elephant? So when we see an imaginary picture, we are looking at it from somewhere, and if you can move that somewhere, then that's how we find out if the, the people that we work with have this gift of dyslexia, mm. because if you can see the elephant from all different ways, right, and then you're going to put a lowercase d in front of somebody, right? Mm -hmm. If I'm doing that to the lowercase d, this is not useful. So mm -hmm. the gift that we have in the three-dimensional world is fantastic, and it leads to so many um, mm -hmm. amazing talents and, and gifts, and, and a lot of sportsmen and designers and city planners, um, they would have to have this way of thinking mm -hmm. to be able to be good at what they're doing. But as soon as you hit that two-dimensional world, which is not meant to be seen from all those different yeah. angles, then you're in trouble. Yeah. So that's the first part of it. The second part of it is that we have this system that is created for the sound-based learner, and we happen to be the non-sound-based learner. And the third part of it is that because we think in pictures, we need a picture to think with. So if I say to you, table or desk or chair, you've got a picture, right? But when I say word, it's like the and if and of and yet and when we have no image behind those pictures and because we're trying to create the film the film in our head is sort of there for a second and then it's gone and then it's there for a second and it's gone well we wouldn't stay in a movie theater where that was mm -hmm. happening to the film right and so we get lost and we we sort of drift off and we find them the movie theater that's got the continuous film which is called our imagination and we and as a child we get accused of daydreaming and uh, and not paying attention right um, and that's our fault as, as mm -hmm. the teachers if you like because we didn't give them enough images to keep them mm -hmm. there right and um and that's the that's the mixture. This this wonderful gift, this this system that 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 um, teaches us in a way that is not our way. Mm -hmm. And then we have we don't get everything we need anyway in terms of the, the visual. Mm -hmm. And when we're reading a page of text, we get to the bottom and we think, what was that about? <laughs> like you might be able to get through the words, but you yeah. can't. Um, so so yeah. having said that, quite quickly, <laughs> how, how does that feel in, in terms of what you had Yeah, well, it's totally true. You know, I love infographics, <laughs> right? I, I have, my wife hates them, can't understand them. Uh, she would rather have a, a, a Word document to read or a linear Excel or something like that to, to read. Um, to understand a point, whereas you give me an infographic, and and you know all the, even the doodles that I do will will be infographics that I'm doing on my whiteboard and all that sort of stuff. So, um, that's yeah, that's that's my mind. Is yeah. my mind, as I joke, is usually a big infographic. But yeah. Well, no. It, 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 <laughs> yeah. Do you ever watch TED Talks? Yeah. There's one by um, oh gosh, Sir Ken Robinson. And while he's talking, there's somebody cartooning what mm, he's saying. Yeah. It's absolutely we used to do that uh, at Metro Vancouver uh, when we did workshops. We'd bring in a cartoonist that would do like a four by eight piece of paper and they would just listen to the conversation, uh, the dialogue that was going on, and then they would uh, doodle it for the most part. That's awesome. Yeah, they were awesome. Yeah. Great for dyslexics, just in general. To oh, explain yeah. something where you have the teacher saying something and the person's drawing out yeah. something. That'd be wicked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 
So Tristan has come across his dyslexia um, yeah. oh, <laughs> recently. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I knew I had it growing up, but I had no idea what it meant. Not a clue. And I just thought it for the longest time I was dumb because I couldn't understand what people were trying to explain to me. So I can I can relate for sure. I mean, all three of us can. Yeah. It's been a, definitely a bumpy ride, but I find when you, like, do, were, you, were you into any sports? Yeah, like, all sports. All kinds of sports. Because yeah, yeah. I, I, for whatever reason, I could never really play soccer very well or, or basketball, but if I was doing, like, uh, jiu-jitsu or contact sport like that, I could visually imagine where the person was going depending yeah. on how their feeling was on me or whatever. So I was, I can cue into that in yeah. a good sense, and I don't know why. I mean, well, dyslexia yeah, yeah. does help, but... It, it's a it's a funny world, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. How we think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and it, and it, it's, it's totally a funny world. Well, I guess it's a funny world. I don't know any other way. So yeah. I, I assume that it's different than everyone else to a certain... Although I, I should say, I didn't assume it was different. Let me yeah. clarify that. I just... I did. I thought everybody thought the way that yeah. I thought. Yeah. And everybody could picture things. And it really it was only, I'm going to say, five years ago or something like that. I was sitting at a council meeting and I was describing my vision for downtown Poco, like what I could picture in my head. Yeah. And I was describing it, and I think I was doing pretty good. And, and mm. one of the counselors said, Greg, I, I hear what you're saying. It sounds amazing, mm. but I can't picture it. Yeah. I, I, but it sounds good. You know, we need to get someone in that can do some renderings, yeah. and actually, because I'm not really much of an artist, mm. uh, even though I love doodling and stuff, but I'm no architect. So yeah. it, it, that's when it really, so it was literally only like five years ago that sort of struck me that not everybody... And then I started doing some research and realized that the vast majority of people actually don't have, you know, the big theater in their mind that yeah. we might. Yeah. But, but I think that's the most important question um, when we're trying to, to, to reach somebody, whether we're teaching or informing or whatever. Um, we never say to anybody, how are you thinking? Yeah. We're always asking them, what are you thinking? Yeah. But we're never asking that's how. And so every single person in this world thinks that everybody learns like they do. Yeah. I did, yeah. right? I thought, um, and when one of my friends said, well, I never, I've, I've never had a picture in my head ever. And I thought, you're kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, so I mean, yeah, exactly. Doesn't that sound boring? Oh, so yeah. the thing is, there's this continuum, right? And the people down the sound end who don't have the images are looking at us down the other end when we're all visual and kinesthetic and they're thinking, seriously? And, and we're doing the same to them. Are you kidding yeah. me? Um, and yet that is a question in, that I've never heard anybody mm, ask yeah. me is how do, how do you think yeah. but if we don't know how people think how do we know how to reach them yeah i suspect most people wouldn't know how to answer that though as I well i know they'd because, move away from you <laughs> well they would because i think most people assume that we all think the same way exactly. yeah regardless of, of it's who weird you are. to think that we all think we think the same way, considering we're all doing we all do different things. Yeah, you know what I mean? yeah, yeah. It's like, how <laughs> well, we? and we all know that we all have different skills, right? Like you know, yeah. accountants are phenomenal at numbers, and yeah. engineers, and yeah. you know, construction workers that can figure out how to build stuff. Like it, we all have all these skills. So yeah. to to think that we think, that we think all the yeah. same is we probably this is going to be too much thinking we probably haven't put a lot of thought into yeah. it um, into the fact that we probably don't because we don't we don't lead the same we don't act the same we don't have the same personalities we don't you know people number people all that sort of stuff so why would we assume that we think the same well, we, we tend to think that goes with personality and characteristics yeah. do you know what I mean rather yeah. than actually how we think but yeah. the thing is um, getting to back to the education system um, I happen to know that there is a very simple method that you can put into kindergarten to grade three where you can reach everybody right mm. so if if you if you've got a method that you introduce um, the classroom teacher introduces it and it reaches both the little PC and the little Apple Mac right and it's based a, more on on our way of thinking but it certainly doesn't leave the sound thinkers out in the cold mm. then the, the challenges would never happen they mm. only happen because this way of thinking meets a system that doesn't think that way mm. and so um, we have tried it um, and it does work and it would be lovely to think we could get it into the school system Mm -hmm. Um, because I think that um, we're leaving a lot of people out in the cold and um, they this is a frightening statistic that in the states they 
they test children at a grade four reading level to find out how many prisons they need to build. <laughs> I mean, honestly, and 75% of all felons have this learning challenge, yeah. have a learning challenge rather. Yeah. That's the frightening part yeah. to me. Um, well, and it's a, a lot of uh, government is reactionary. Yeah. Right, and, and what you're describing there is just a reactionary state yeah. uh, instead of a proactive yeah. state, which you were alluding to earlier about uh, if we could do things right from kindergarten to grade three, grade four, uh, and, and change how we teach, then we could save money 30 years down the road. But. You know, yeah. most governments, unfortunately, don't think that way, right? <laughs> That's because they think a different way to us. <laughs> well, they, they no. think a different way. They also uh, have this thing called democracy <laughs> that uh, they have to get elected. Yes. And if they're saying, you know what, I'm going to do everything for 30 years from now. Everything I do is going to be about 30 years. Well, they won't be there another no, term, and no. then someone else will come in. So right. I guess I'm maybe a little defensive as a politician because no, no. you are balancing what the needs are of today's society That's as true. well as trying to look five, ten, and sometimes 30, 50 years Absolutely. down the road. But that's the one Absolutely. of the challenges. Yeah, and and currently what happens is there, there's a push on early intervention, mm -hmm. right, which sounds very, very um, plausible, right? But the point is you don't need to test the children. You don't need to pull them out of class. You don't need to give them a label if you reach them all at the very beginning, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then when you do test them and they do come up with a label, they start living their label, number one, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. number two, all the education system has at the moment is accommodations. So yeah. nowadays, um, it's a bit of a losing battle because, like yourself, if, yay, speech to text, woohoo, I don't have to read, I don't have to write, yeah. right? But at the same time, the kids that I'm working with, they do actually want to read and they do actually want to write. And sure, the accommodations can help with the overload because there's probably too much reading or, you know, too much writing. But... They do, I think they have a right to that basic skill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's interesting you talk about labels and that sort of thing. So one of the things that, uh, I don't know if they still do in school, but uh, when I was in school, they had a program in grade 11 or grade 12, and you know, you sort of do whatever, I can't remember what the testing was, and it sort of predicts what you're going to be in the future, mm -hmm. right? Sort of mm -hmm. career path mm -hmm. stuff. And my dad, like I said, my dad was a high school counselor, so he was a teacher. And uh, probably like most kids, you want to be what your parents are. So I remember going through that, and it said I was going to be a construction worker. And uh, I said, no, I'm not. I want to be a teacher like my dad. What's wrong with your system? <laughs> um, and I, I, I basically dismissed it. Um, but I know, like, but that's what they told my parents. Like, don't expect a lot because mm. he's got these learning disabilities and he won't be able to function in, you know, there's no way he could get a degree or anything like that to become a teacher. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, I just, maybe I'm stubborn to a certain extent, but ignored it. Or, um, and I remember though going to Douglas College um, after high school and playing basketball there and stuff and, and getting my, transferring to SFU. So I got my diploma, I guess, from Douglas College and I didn't go to the graduation. And I remember my dad being really challenged with that because he was told that like don't expect much more like high school graduation is going to kind of be the the apex of his uh, education and then so I get a diploma and I'm like I'm not going this isn't the edge of my, end of my education I don't want this to be like the, the 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 apex of it so I didn't go and I think he was a little put off but then obviously pretty proud a few late years later when I got my undergrad degree yes so. yeah and you got through your undergrad at SFU? And yeah, I did my undergrad at SFU, and I did an MBA at Royal Roads afterwards. So as I, as I progressed in post-secondary education, though, I started to learn more a lot about how I learn, how I write, and all that sort of stuff. And so, uh, in fact, my grades got much, much better as I got into graduate work and that sort of thing. Um, partially because you don't have to do as much testing. Mm -hmm. Right when you're in first year college or university, you write a couple papers, but you write a lot of tests, mm -hmm. and we're mm -hmm. terrible at tests. Mm -hmm. We know that we know the information inside and out, mm -hmm. but writing it, you know, all it would come back is like it was like a bloodshed with all the red ink on my yeah. right from <laughs> spelling wrong and sentence structure. It's like yeah, uh, but just look at the content is all right. And also the other part, talking about how we think is, um, and I don't know if you guys have this, but. I assume a lot about what people know. I assume that people are at the same, whether it's visualizing something or saying, so I, even in my relationship with my wife, I assume way too much uh, about whatever we're talking about. I'm 10 steps down the path 
and I forget to talk about the first five steps. So that hurt me in my education as well. Because like I'd get a whatever, five out of ten or something on a score. I'm like, yeah, but I couldn't have answered that if that didn't happen. Why do I have to write that down? And, and it's just because that's the way the system is. Yeah. So as, I, as you get old, as you, as you go through education, you get into higher, you know, third and fourth year university and then into graduate work and stuff like that. It's project based. So you can actually take it away and you write more. You might write more, but you can have proofreaders. You can have people look at it and, and fix it all before you actually yeah. submit it. You're not, know, sort of, quote unquote, tested as much in, in a traditional way. Uh, that, that's so funny what you're saying because I'm trying to do this exactly what you're saying. I Because I know what you're going to say, I really want to interrupt. <laughs> I, isn't that funny? I know exactly what you're going to say. I know exactly what yeah. I want to say. And I've been very good and I didn't interrupt. <laughs> but, but that's that's something that happens quite often for me and um, the other thing with with just knowing the answer um, we happen to think in 32 images a second which is faster than a film would come through at the, the movie theater that would be 24 25 a second right and so um, because the film has come through faster and because we happen to know the answer my son used to get into terrible trouble with math because he wouldn't have the answer yeah, yeah. Um, he was good at math yeah, yeah. he didn't do this reading and the writing thing but um, but he loved math and he knew the answer and it came down right every time yeah, but yeah. he couldn't show anybody how he got there yeah. and he was accused of cheating because that would be the only way that he would get it and I said to him he's not cheating um, you know if it's yeah. always right whatever he's doing in his head is just fine don't mess with it I was the same way and and I would uh, I would argue I guess debate with the teachers like well I couldn't get that answer if I didn't do the steps just because I didn't put them down for you exactly. isn't the point the yeah. answer yeah. they wanted to prove that to show that you understand show your work right exactly show, your work, show your work show your work show your work really yeah. I didn't know. I, I couldn't figure out how I got there, but I'm like, oh, it's like the answer's 29. They're like, how do you know that? I'm like, I, I really don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Even today with, with business math and that sort of mm -hmm. stuff mm -hmm. and using Excel, I can, you know, my wife's like, you're such a wizard at that. I'm like, mm -hmm. okay. Like, it just mm -hmm. putting all the different formulas in and making it all that just comes pretty That's so easy. Cool. Yeah. That's but you were also talking about old solutions. We, well, with what we call the, um, we call coping mechanisms old solutions, right? Yeah. And you you have um, the the dependence one, which is obviously getting somebody else to do it. You have the avoidance one. Well, I'm not going to school. You can't make me. You have the class clown, and a lot of comedians started out like that, yeah. right? With Robin Williams and Jay Leno yeah. and and so on. And uh, and then what else do you have? The concentration, which is the one that really. Um, gets you tired and headaches and stomach aches and repeated washroom breaks and <laughs> yeah. so we, we just yeah. have to cope somehow we really do yeah and I think it's about understanding those and and but it's also about the people around you understanding those so I think you know one of the one of the reasons for my success is I've had phenomenal um, support networks around me that just love me and want the best for me so in the obviously in the beginning of life it was my parents and and my parents were great and and um, but I do remember sitting at the kitchen table with my dad and him trying to teach me what in the report that I was writing the English errors and I'm like I don't want to I can't learn it just and so then my wife has just been you know she's my wife but she's my partner and she's my you know proofreader and all that sort of stuff um, and but probably for the first I don't know I'm gonna guess 10 years of our relationship um, when I'd bring work home and I'm like can you just proofread this report or whatever she'd also want to teach me and I'm like I don't I I would actually say I can't learn it like and I don't want to learn it like I got a lot of other good stuff going on in here I don't really care to learn it even at this point uh, and so she's now um, and she's doing it out of love and, mm -hmm. and all this sort of great stuff. But now when I ask, even to this day, I'll ask her to read stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and she'll just read it and fix it. Mm -hmm. Because I don't really, like, mm -hmm. I don't care. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I just yeah. don't care to what? be a good speller anymore or sentence structure. I just... I got too much other good stuff to worry about. Well, well the whole grammar thing is is uh, uh, something that the linear sequential world love, right? Yeah. And it's a little bit like sometimes they teach math that way, Kate. That sometimes they say, well, do this, do this, do this, and you get the right answer. But we work the opposite way. So if we have the concept of what is going on, then we can find our own steps sometimes, mm. right? But but we do need that, that sort of visual concept. Yeah. I was very, very old before I actually understood what multiplying was. I knew how to do it, right? And 
and I knew yeah. you had to recite all these tables and you can use that silly chart with the numbers, yeah. right? Um, but until somebody said, well, it's actually adding the same number over and over, and I thought, oh, <laughs> <laughs> why didn't yeah. you tell me that? But it's yeah. little things like that yeah. that actually make a huge difference. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, I, like I said, I think you get to a certain point. Maybe because your career is at a certain point, or you're old enough, and you're like, I don't even care. I just, you know what? I'm not going to spend. I'm not going to waste my my energy and time to learn this stuff because I figured out really effective ways to to manage it, yeah. and and that works for me. And do do what you're good at. Don't yeah. worry about what others think about your spelling and stuff like that. You just don't yeah. have time to get. Oh, it totally. I, like I I I I rarely proofread an email. Which I know is not good. No, but I, mean, I know, and I don't write long emails. No. Uh, I don't write long emails for a couple of different reasons. Because in political life, in this job, everything I do pretty much gets FOI, so it gets um, we have to d expose it to the world. So it's like, well, um, perfect. Mm. I got a reason why I shouldn't write a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a lot more meetings, I think, maybe than the average person yeah. because I'd rather have a yeah. conversation with yeah. someone than uh, than write a, a four-page email yeah. or even yeah. a two-paragraph email. One of my students, who's about Chris, Tristan's age, says that if I send him an email of more than two lines, his computer automatically deletes it. <laughs> <laughs> Is it the computer between his two ears? Yeah. It could be. It could be. But I'm mindful of your time, and you've you've done so much, and you've said so much, um, and I'm very, very grateful to you. Oh, thank um, you. If there's anything else you'd like to finish off with, a message to the world about yeah. what to... Um, yeah, I think I think for for me, I think all of us have unique journeys in life, and even if we all have dyslexia and we can all relate to the stories and the conversations, um, but our journeys are unique. The people that are around us are unique and that sort of thing. And 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 I, I'm not, you know, I, I don't think I would have changed anything in the way that I've done dealing with dyslexia in my life. I don't think I would have exposed it earlier on for me and what I was going through. Um, it was probably for all the wrong reasons that I didn't disclose it because I didn't want to be seen as weak. I didn't want to be judged and, and being in a political light, you know, people will, will judge you quite quickly for pretty much anything. Um, then you throw a big thing like this out there and then, and so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty, well, obviously I'm comfortable in my life now and, and I'm glad to be able to share it with you and, and whoever's listening. And, and it, one of the things I think that I, so when I gave that, to go full circle, when I gave that speech to the uh, Dakota, and really the theme was, I came and gave my story, but the, the underlying theme was the love and the support I've had in my life, uh, whether it was my parents or teachers along the way, even though it was kind of torturous going through English classes again, but um, but all of that love and, and then my wife just being so phenomenal. Mm. Um, what I really took away from that was the people that came to me afterwards, because I wasn't the only one in tears on a stage, uh -huh. uh, the whole room was, um, people coming up to me and saying, you know, you've opened my eyes to, I'm in after school care, and I've got these young kids that had, they might not have dyslexia, but they got some sort of learning disability. And she goes, I, I was about to quit because I can't teach them. And she goes, you told me, no, I'm going to cry. She goes, told me that you don't have to teach them you just have to love them and that's all they want is love and they want people just to surround them and support them and, and like we talked about um, emphasize the gifts they have uh, whether you understand them or not if they love coloring after school and they don't want to learn their sentence structure then just color and talk about it and just give them that love and that support and so many people came up to me afterwards and, and shared those stories that they're reinvigorated to do things differently so, so I think that's the cool part so great I yeah. totally believe that believe in them that's the most important thing that you yeah. can possibly yeah. do believe yeah them. believe in them love them support yeah. them yeah. celebrate them yeah don't label them. Don't no. make them do things that they don't want to do. No. Well, I can <laughs> don't see force that. another <laughs> spelling bee on them to <laughs> test for tomorrow's spelling bee. <laughs> yeah. and I, I can totally see why people believe in you. And I'm so grateful for your time. And thank, thank you. you. Thank Thanks you for very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Wasn't that incredible? It was such a privilege to listen as he shared his story. We hope you'll be with us for the next podcast with Tristan. He discovered his gifts and saw his challenges in a different light after his Davis Dyslexia program. In the meantime, you can reach us at www.thewds.org. 
If you have any requests or questions, just reach out to us. Until next time.